Chapter 4 April Turkey Mole with Almonds and Sesame Seeds Preparation Two days after killing the turkey, clean it and cook with salt. Turkey meat can be delicious, even exquisite, if the turkey has been fattened up properly. This can be accomplished by keeping the birds in clean pens with plenty of corn and water. Fifteen days before the turkey is to be killed, begin feeding it small walnuts. Start with one the first day, the next day put two in its beak, and keep increasing the number this way until the night before it's killed, regardless of how much corn it eats voluntarily during this period. Tita took care to feed the turkeys properly. She wanted the feast to go well, for the ranch was celebrating an important event, the baptism of her nephew, first son of Pedro and Rosaura. This event warranted a grand meal with mole. She had had a special set of earthenware dishes made for the occasion with the name Roberto on them, for that is what they had named the beautiful baby, on whom all the family and friends were lavishing gifts and attention, especially Tita, who, contrary to what she had expected, felt an immense tenderness toward the boy, completely overlooking the fact that he was the product of her sister's marriage to Pedro, the love of her life. She was really excited as she started to prepare the mole the day before the baptism. Pedro, hearing her from the living room, experienced a sensation that was new to him. The sound of the pans bumping against each other, the smell of the almonds browning in the griddle, the sound of Tita's melodious voice singing as she cooked, had kindled his sexual feelings. Just as lovers know the time for intimate relations is approaching from the closeness and smell of their beloved or from the caresses exchanged in previous love play, so Pedro knew from those sounds and smells, especially the smell of browning sesame seeds, that there was a real culinary pleasure to come. The almond and sesame seeds are toasted in a griddle. The chiles anchos, with their membranes removed, are also toasted lightly so they don't get bitter. This must be done in a separate frying pan since a little lard is used. Afterward, the toasted chiles are ground on a stone along with the almonds and sesame seeds. Tita, on her knees, was bent over the grinding stone, moving in a slow, regular rhythm, grinding the almonds and sesame seeds. Under her blouse, her breasts moved freely, since she never wore a brassiere. Drops of sweat formed on her neck and ran down into the crease between her firm, round breasts. Pedro couldn't resist the smells from the kitchen and was heading toward them, but he stopped stock still in the doorway, transfixed by the sight of Tita in that erotic posture. Tita looked up without stopping her grinding, and her eyes met Pedro's. At once their passionate glances fused so perfectly that whoever saw them would have seen but a single look, a single rhythmic and sensual motion, a single trembling breath, a single desire. They stayed in this amorous ecstasy until Pedro lowered his eyes and stared steadily at Tita's breasts. She stopped grinding, straightened up, and proudly lifted her chest so Pedro could see it better. His scrutiny changed their relationship forever. After that penetrating look that saw through clothes, nothing would ever be the same. Tita knew through her own flesh how fire transforms the elements, how a lump of corn flour is changed into a tortilla, how a soul that hasn't been warmed by the fire of love is lifeless, like a useless ball of corn flour. In a few moments' time, Pedro had transformed Tita's breasts from chaste to experienced flesh without even touching them. If it hadn't been for Chencha walking in, back from buying some chiles anchos, who knows what would have happened between Pedro and Tita. Perhaps Pedro would have ended up tirelessly caressing the breasts Tita offered him, but unfortunately that was not to be. Pedro pretended he had come in for a glass of lime water with sage, quickly got it, and left the kitchen. With shaking hands, Tita tried to go on preparing the mole as if nothing happened. When the almonds and sesame seeds have been thoroughly ground, mix them with a the stock in which the turkey was cooked and add salt to taste. Grind the cloves, cinnamon, anise, and pepper in a mortar, adding the roll last after frying it in lard with chopped onion and garlic. 
Next, combine this mixture with the wine and blend well. While she was grinding the spices, Chincha tried in vain to capture Tita's interest. But as much as she exaggerated the events she had witnessed in the plaza, describing in bloody detail the violent battles that had taken place in the village, Tita showed no more than a flicker of interest. Today, she couldn't keep her mind on anything other than the emotions she had just experienced. Besides, Tita knew perfectly well what Chencha was up to with these stories, since she wasn't a girl to be frightened by stories of La Llorona, the witch who sucks little children's blood, or the boogeyman, or other scary stories. Chencha was trying to frighten her with stories of hangings, shootings, dismemberments, decapitations, and even sacrifices in which the victim's heart was cut out. In the heat of battle, on some other occasion, she might have enjoyed getting carried away by Chencha's ridiculous story and wound up believing her lies, even the ones where Pancho Villa removes his enemy's bloody hearts so he can devour them. But not today. Pedro's look had revived her faith in his love for her. For months, she'd been tormented by the thought that Pedro had lied to her on his wedding day, that he told her he loved her just so she wouldn't suffer or that as time went on, he really had grown to love Rosaura. These doubts started when he suddenly, inexplicably, stopped raving about her cooking. Crushed, Tita took elaborate pains to cook better meals each day. In despair at night, after she had knit a little section of the bedspread, of course, she would invent new recipes, hoping to repair the connection that flowed between them through the food she prepared. Her finest recipes date from this period of suffering. Just as a poet plays with words, Tita juggled ingredients and quantities at will, obtaining phenomenal results, and all for nothing. Her best efforts were in vain. She couldn't drag a single word of appreciation out of Pedro's mouth. What she didn't know was that Mamá Elena had asked Pedro to stop praising the meals on the grounds that it made Rosaura feel insecure, when she was fat and misshapen because of her pregnancy, to have to listen to him compliment Tita in the guise of praising the delicious food she cooked. How alone Tita felt during this period. How she missed Nacha. She hated them all, including Pedro. She was convinced she would never love anyone again as long as she lived. But it all melted away when she held Rosara's son in her hands. It had been a cold March morning, she was in the hen house gathering the just laid eggs to fix them for breakfast. Some of the eggs were still warm, so she put them in her blouse next to her skin to relieve her constant chill, which had gradually been getting worse. She got up before everyone else as usual, but today she'd gotten up a half hour earlier than usual to pack a suitcase with Gertrudis clothes. Nicholas was making a trip to round up some cattle, and she planned to ask him to please take the suitcase to her sister. Of course, she had to hide all of this from her mother. Tita wanted to send the clothes because she couldn't get the idea that Gertrudis was still naked out of her head. Not, of course, because of her sister's work in a border town brothel, rather because Tita knew she hadn't taken any clothes with her. She thrust at Nicholas a suitcase of clothes and an envelope bearing the address of the den where he might find Gertrudis, and she went back to her chores. Soon she heard Pedro getting the carriage ready. Strange that he was doing it so early, but she saw from the sunlight that it was already late, that packing up some of Gertrudis' past along with her clothes had taken longer than she had imagined. It hadn't been easy to fit into the suitcase the day the three of them made their first communion. The veil, the prayer book, the photo taken outside the church all fit in pretty well, but not the taste of the tamales and atole Nacha had made, which they had eaten afterward with their friends and families. The little colored apricots had gone in, but not their laughter when they played with them in the schoolyard, nor Jovita, their teacher, the swing, the smell of her bedroom, or a freshly whipped chocolate. Luckily, Mamá Elena's scoldings and spankings hadn't fit in either. Tita had slammed the suitcase shut before they could sneak in. Just as she got to the patio, Pedro began calling her desperately. He had to go to Eagle Pass for Dr. Brown, the family doctor, and he hadn't been able to find her anywhere. Rosada had felt the first pains of labor. Pedro asked Tita to please take care of her while he was gone. Tita was the only one who could do it. 
No one else was left in the house. Mama Elena and Chencha had gone to the market to buy supplies for the baby, who was due any minute. They didn't want to lack any of the things that are indispensable at such a time. They hadn't been able to go earlier because it had been too dangerous after the federal troops had occupied the village. They didn't know when they left that the baby would arrive so soon, for just as they left, Rosaura had gone into labor. Tita had no choice but to go to her sister's bedside, hoping it wouldn't be for long. She didn't have the least interest in seeing the little boy, girl, whatever. She hadn't anticipated Pedro getting captured by the federales and summarily detained from getting the doctor, or Mamá Elena and Chencha being unable to return because of shooting breaking out in the village that forced them to take refuge with the lobos. So it turned out she was the only one present at the birth of her nephew. She, alone. In the hours she spent by her sister's side, she learned more than in all the years she studied in the village school. She denounced all her teachers and her mamma for never having told her how to deliver a baby. What good did it do her now to know the names of the planets in Carreno's manual from A to Z if her sister was practically dead and she couldn't help her? Rosaura had gained 65 pounds during her pregnancy, which made the labor to deliver her first child even more difficult. Even allowing for her sister's excessive bulk, Tita noticed that Rosaura's body was extraordinarily swollen. First her feet swelled up, then her face and hands. Tita wiped the sweat from her brow and tried to revive her, but Rosaura didn't even seem to hear her. Tita had seen some animals being born, but those experiences didn't help with this birth. She had been only a spectator on those occasions. The animals knew everything they had to do, whereas she knew nothing. She had prepared sheets, hot water, and sterilized scissors. She knew she had to cut the umbilical cord, but she didn't know how or when, nor to what length. She knew there was a series of little things she had to do for the baby as soon as it entered this world, but she didn't know what they were. The only thing she knew was that first it had to be born, any moment now. Tita peeked between her sister's legs repeatedly, but nothing. Nothing but a tunnel, dark, silent, deep. Kneeling and facing Rosaura, Tita made an urgent request to Nacha to enlighten her at this time. If Nacha could tell her recipes in the kitchen, she should also be able to help in this emergency. Somebody up there had better attend to Rosaura because there was nobody down here to do so. She didn't know how long she knelt in prayer, but when she pried her eyes open, the dark tunnel of a moment before had been transformed into a red river, an erupting volcano, a rending of paper. Her sister's flesh opened to make way for life. Tita would never forget that sound or the way her nephew's head had emerged, triumphant in his struggle for life. It was not a beautiful head. Indeed, it was shaped like a cone of brown sugar because of the pressure his bones had been under for so many hours. But to Tita, it seemed the most beautiful head she'd ever seen. The baby's cries filled all the empty space in Tita's heart. She realized that she was feeling a new love for life, for this child, for Pedro, even for the sister she had despised for so long. She took the child in her hands, carried him to Rosaura, and they wept together for a while, holding the child. She knew exactly what to do for the baby afterward from the instructions Nacha whispered in her ear. Cut the umbilical cord in the right place at the right time, clean him with sweet almond oil, bind the navel, and finally dress him. No problem. She knew how to put on the undershirt and the shirt, the swaddling band around his belly, the diaper, the flannel to cover his legs, the little jacket, the socks and shoes, and last of all, a soft wrap to keep his hands crossed on his chest so he wouldn't scratch his face. When Mamá Elena and Chencha finally arrived home that night with the lobos, they all admired the professional job Tita had done. Wrapped up like a taco, the baby was sleeping peacefully. Pedro made it back with Dr. Brown the next day after the federales set him free. His return was a relief to all of them. They had feared for his life. Now their only worry was Rosada's health, since she was still swollen and was very weak. Dr. Brown examined her thoroughly. That was when they discovered how dangerous the birth had been. 
According to the doctor, Rosaura had suffered an attack of eclampsia that could have killed her. He was amazed that Tita had been able to assist at the birth so calmly and deliberately and under such unfavorable conditions. Well, who knows what really excited his admiration, whether it was just the way Tita had delivered the baby by herself with no experience, or how the toothy little girl he remembered had become a beautiful woman without his having noticed. No woman had attracted him since the death of his wife. He was so amazed that Tita had been able to assist at the birth so calmly and deliberately and under such unfavorable conditions. Well, who knows what really excited his admiration, whether it was just the way Tita had delivered the little baby by herself with no experience, or how the toothy little girl he remembered had become a beautiful woman without his having noticed. No woman had attracted him since the death of his wife five years before. The pain of losing her practically as a newlywed had made him impervious to love all these years. What a strange sensation he felt when he looked at Tita. A tingling sensation ran through his body, rousing and quickening his sleeping senses. He looked at her as if he was seeing her for the first time. How lovely her teeth seemed now, assuming their true proportion within the perfect harmony of delicate features that formed her face. His thoughts were interrupted by Mama Elena's voice. Doctor, won't it be too much trouble for you to come here twice a day until my daughter is out of danger? Well, certainly not. First, it's my duty, and second, it's a pleasure to visit your lovely home. It was fortunate indeed that Mamma Elena was so worried about Rosada's health that she didn't see the way John Brown's eyes lit up with admiration when he looked at Tita, because if she had, she never would have opened the door of her home to him so confidently. Right now, the doctor didn't seem a problem to Mamma Elena. Her only worry was that Rosada didn't have any milk. Fortunately, they found a wet nurse in the village whom they hired to nurse the baby one of Nacha's relatives. She had just had her eighth child and was grateful for the honor of feeding Mama Elena's grandson. For a month she performed marvelously. Then one morning, while on her way to the village to visit her family, she was struck by a stray bullet from a battle between the rebels and the federales and was mortally wounded. One of her relatives arrived at the ranch to bring them the news, just as Tita and Chencha were combining all the ingredients for the mole in a large earthenware pan. That is the final step, which is done when all the ingredients have been ground as indicated in the recipe. Combine them in a large pan, add the cut-up turkey, the chocolate, and sugar to taste. As soon as the mixture thickens, remove it from the heat. Tita finished preparing the mole alone. Since the minute she heard the news, Chencha left for the village to try to find another nurse for Tita's nephew. She returned that evening without success. The baby was crying angrily. They tried giving him cow's milk, but he rejected it. Then Tita tried giving him tea, as Nacha had done for her, but it was no use. The child rejected that, too. It occurred to Tita that if she put on the rebozo that Lupita, the wet nurse, had left behind, its familiar smell might soothe the baby. It had just the opposite effect, and he cried even harder, because its smell told him that he was going to be fed, and he couldn't understand why there was this delay. He was frantically trying to find the milk in Tita's breasts. If there was one thing Tita couldn't resist, it was a hungry person asking for food. But she had none to give. It was sheer torture. When she couldn't stand it a moment longer, she pulled open her blouse and offered the baby her breast. She knew it was completely dry, but at least it would act as a pacifier and keep him occupied while she decided what to do to appease his hunger. The baby clamped desperately onto the nipple, and he sucked and he sucked. When she saw the boy's face slowly grow peaceful, and when she heard the way he was swallowing, she began to suspect that something extraordinary was happening. Was it possible that she was feeding the baby? She removed the boy from her breast. A thin stream of milk sprayed out. Tita could not understand it. It wasn't possible for an unmarried woman to have milk, short of a supernatural act, unheard of in these times. When the child realized he'd been separated from his meal, he started to wail again. Immediately, Tita let him take her breast, until his hunger was completely satisfied and he was sleeping peacefully, like a saint. She was so absorbed in her contemplation in the child that she didn't notice Pedro coming into the kitchen. 
At this moment, Tita looked like Ceres herself, goddess of plenty. Pedro wasn't surprised in the least, nor did he need an explanation. Smiling delightedly, he went over to them, bent down, and kissed Tita on the forehead. Tita took the child, now satisfied from her breast. Then Pedro's eyes beheld a sight that he'd only glimpsed before through her clothing, Tita's breasts. Tita tried to cover herself with her blouse. Pedro helped her in silence with great tenderness. As he did, a succession of conflicting emotions took hold of them. Love, desire, tenderness, lust, shame, fear of discovery. The sound of Mamá Elena's footsteps on the wooden floor warned them of the danger in time. Tita finished adjusting her blouse properly, and Pedro moved away from her as Mamá Elena came into the kitchen. When she opened the door, she didn't see anything that wasn't socially acceptable. Nothing to make her worry. Still, there was something in the air she could smell it, and she sharpened her senses to try to figure out what was troubling her. Tita, how's the child? Did you manage to get him to eat something? Yes, mami. He took some tea and fell asleep. Thank God. Then, Pedro, why aren't you taking the child to his mother? Children shouldn't be away from their mothers. Pedro left with the child in his arms, while Mamá Elena carefully observed Tita, who had a sparkle in her eye that Mamá Elena didn't like at all. Is the chocolate atole ready for your sister? Yes, mami. Give it to me so I can take it to her. She needs to drink it day and night so her milk will come in. But as much chocolate atole as she drank, Rosaura never had any milk. Whereas Tita had enough milk to feed Roberto and two more babies besides, if she wanted to, from that day on. And Rosaura was still weak sometimes. No one was surprised that Tita took over her nephew's feeding. What no one found out was how she fed him since Tita, with Pedro's help, was very careful not to let anyone see her. For that reason, the baby, instead of driving them apart, actually brought them closer together. It was as if the child's mother was Tita and not Rosaura. That's how she felt and acted. The day of the baptism, how proudly she carried her nephew, showing him off to all of the guests. Rosaura had to limit her appearance to the church since she felt too sick. So Tita took her place at the banquet. John Brown, the doctor, was watching Tita, charmed by her. He couldn't take his eyes off of her. John had attended the baptism just to see if he could speak to her alone. Even though he saw her every day during the house calls he made to Rosaura, he had never had a chance to speak freely to her without someone else being there. When Tita walked by the table where he was sitting, he got up and went over to her on the pretext of admiring the baby. How nice the child looks with such a beautiful aunt holding him. Thank you, doctor. He isn't even your own son. Imagine how pretty you will look with one of your own. A look of sorrow crossed Tita's face. John saw it and said, Forgive me. It seems I've said the, something wrong. No, it's not that. I can't marry or have children because I have to take care of my mother until she dies. But how can that be? It's absurd. But it's true. Now please excuse me, I have to attend to my guests. Tita quickly moved away from John, leaving him completely shaken. She was too, but she recovered when she felt Roberto in her arms. What did her fate matter when she had this child near her, this child who was as much hers as anybody's? Really, she did a mother's work without the official title. Pedro and Roberto were hers, and that was all she needed. Tita was so happy that she didn't realize that her mother, like John, except that she had a different motive, was not letting her out of her sight for a single instant. She was convinced that something was going on between Tita and Pedro. Trying to catch them, she didn't even eat, and she was so intent on the task of watching them that she hardly noticed the success of the party. Everyone agreed that a large part of the credit should go to Tita. The mole she had prepared was delicious. She kept getting compliments on her skill as a cook, and everyone wanted to know what her secret was. It was really a shame that as Tita was answering this question, saying that her secret was to prepare the mole with a lot of love, Pedro happened to be nearby, and that they looked at each other for a fraction of a second like conspirators. 
remembering when Tita had bent over the grinding stone, for the eagle eye of Mama Elena saw the spark that flew between them from twenty feet away, and it troubled her deeply. Actually, among all the guests, she was the only one who felt at all troubled. Everyone, oddly enough, was in a euphoric mood after eating the mole. It had made them unusually cheerful. They laughed and carried on as they never had before and wouldn't again for a long time. The threat of the revolution hung over them, bringing famine and death in its wake. But for those few moments they all seemed determined to forget the bullets flying in the village. The only one who never lost her control was Mama Elena, who was too busy looking for a way to vent her bad temper. When Tita was standing near enough not to miss a single word, she remarked to Father Ignacio in a loud voice, The way things are going, Father, I worry that some day my daughter Rosaura will need a doctor and we won't be able to get one, like when Roberto was born. As soon as she gets her strength back, I think it would be best if she went to live with my cousin in San Antonio and her husband and little boy. She would receive better medical attention there. I don't agree, Doña Elena. Because of the political situation, you need a man to defend the house. I've never needed a man for anything. All by myself. I've done all right with the, my ranch and my daughters. Men aren't that important in this life, father, she said emphatically. Nor is the revolution as dangerous as you make it out. It's worse to have chiles with no water around. Uh, well, that is true, he replied laughing. Ah, Doña Elena, we so clever. And tell me, have you thought about where Pedro will work in San Antonio? He can start as an accountant in my cousin's company. He wouldn't have any problem. His English is perfect. Those words echoed like cannons inside Tita's head. She couldn't let it happen. They couldn't take the child away from her now. She had to keep that from ever happening. Meanwhile, Mama Elena had managed to ruin the party for her, the first party in her life that she had enjoyed. Chapter 5 May Northern Style Chorizo Preparation Heat the vinegar and add the chiles after removing the seeds. When the mixture comes to a boil, remove the pan from the heat and put a lid on it, so that the chiles soften. Chincha set the cover on the pan and ran to the kitchen garden to help Tita look for worms. Mama Elena kept coming into the kitchen to supervise the preparation of the sausage and the preparations for her bath, and they were behind on both. Ever since Pedro Rosaura and Roberto had gone to live in San Antonio, Tita had lost all interest in life except for her interest in feeding worms to a helpless pigeon. Apart from that, the house could fall down and it wouldn't have mattered to her. Chincha didn't even want to think about what would happen if Mama Elena came in and found that Tita wasn't helping make the sausage. They had decided to make the sausage because it's one of the best ways to use the meat from a pig economically and get food that both tastes good and keeps well without risk of spoiling. They had also prepared a lot of salt pork, ham, bacon, and lard. They had to get every possible use from this pig, one of the few animals that had survived the visit the Revolution Army had made to the ranch a few days before. When the rebels arrived, only Mama Elena, Tita, and Chencha, and two farmhands, Rosalio and Guadalupe, were on the ranch. Nicholas, the manager, had not yet come back with the cattle he had been forced to go buy, the scarcity of food had made them kill the animals they depended on, which he was now trying to replace. He had taken along two of his most trustworthy workers to help him, leaving his son Felipe in charge of the ranch, but Mama Elena had relieved him of that duty, sending him to San Antonio, Texas, for news of Pedro and his family. They were afraid something bad had happened to them, since they hadn't heard a thing. Rosalio rode up at a gallop to tell them that a troop of soldiers was approaching the ranch. Mama Elena immediately picked up her shotgun. As she cleaned it, she plotted how to hide her valuables from the greed and gluttony of these men. No one had ever had anything good to say about these revolutionaries, and obviously what she had heard could scarcely be unreliable, since she'd gotten it from Father Ignacio and the mayor of Piedras Negras. They had told her how the rebels entered houses, destroyed everything, and raped all the women in their path. 
she ordered Tita, Chincha, and the pig to stay hidden in the cellar. When the revolutionaries arrived, they were met by Mama Elena at the entrance of the house. She had her shotgun hidden in her petticoats, and she had Rosalio and Guadalupe at her side. Her gaze met that of the captain in charge, and he knew immediately from the steeliness of her eyes that they were in the presence of a woman to be reckoned with. Good afternoon, senora. Are you the owner of this ranch? Yes, I am. What is it you want? We've come to ask you to volunteer to help the cause. I'll volunteer to tell you to take whatever you like from the corn crib and the stable. But that is the limit. I won't allow you to touch anything inside my house, understand? Those things are for my cause. The captain laughed, snapped to attention, and answered her, Understood, my general. This joke tickled all the soldiers, and they laughed heartily, but the captain could see you didn't fool around with Mama Elena, which she said was serious, very serious. Trying not to be intimidated by the fierce, domineering look he got from her, he ordered the soldiers to inspect the ranch. They didn't find much, a little corn for scattering and eight chickens. A frustrated sergeant came back to the captain and said, The old lady must have everything hidden in the house. Let me go in and take a look around. Mama Elena put her finger on the trigger and answered, I'm not joking. I repeat, no one is setting foot in my house. Laughing, swinging the chickens he was carrying in his hands, the sergeant started toward the door. Mama Elena raised the gun, braced herself against the wall so she wouldn't be knocked to the ground by the kick of the gun, and shot the chickens. Bits of chicken flew in every direction along with the smell of burnt feathers. Shaking, Rosalio and Guadalupe got out their pistols, fully convinced that this was their last day on earth. The soldier next to the captain was going to shoot Mama Elena, but the captain motioned him to stop. They were all waiting for his order to attack. I have a good aim and a very bad temper, Captain. The next shot is for you, and I assure you, I can shoot you before they can kill me, so it would be best for us to respect each other. If we die, no one will miss me very much. But won't the nation mourn your loss? It really was hard to meet Mama Elena's gaze, even for the captain. There was something daunting about it. It produced a nameless fear in those who suffered it. They fell prisoner to a childlike fear of maternal authority. You're right. Don't worry. No one is going to kill you or fail to respect you, that's for sure. Such a valiant woman will always have my admiration. He turned to his soldiers and said, No one is to set foot in the house. See what else you can find here and let's go. What they found was the huge dovecoat formed by two slopes of the roof on the enormous house. To get to it, you had to climb up a twenty-foot ladder. Three rebels climbed up and stood there, stunned for some time before they were able to move. They were impressed by the dovecote size and by the darkness and the cooing of the doves gathered there, coming and going through narrow side windows. They closed the door and the windows so none of them could get away and set about trapping the pigeons and doves. They rounded up enough to feed the entire battalion for a week. Before the troops withdrew, the captain rode around the back patio, inhaling deep whiffs of the scent of roses that still clung indelibly to this place. He closed his eyes and was still for quite a while. Returning to Mama Elena's side, he asked her, I understood you had three daughters. Where are they? The oldest and youngest live in the United States. The other died. The news seemed to move the captain. In a barely audible voice, he replied, That is a pity, a very great pity. He took leave of Mama Elena with a bow. They left peacefully just as they had come, and Mama Elena was quite disconcerted by the way they had treated her. It didn't fit the picture of the heartless ruffians she had been expecting. From that day on, she would not express any opinion about the revolutionaries. What she never learned was that this captain was the same Juan Alejandres who had carried off her daughter Getrudis some months before. They were even on that score, for the captain remained ignorant of the large number of chickens that Mamá Elena had hidden behind the house, buried in ashes. They had managed to kill twenty before the troops arrived. The chickens are filled with ground wheat or oats and then placed, feathers and all, into a glazed earthenware pot. The pot is covered tightly using a narrow strip of cloth, 
That way, the meat can be kept for more than a week. It had been a common practice on the ranch since ancient times when they had to preserve animals after a hunting party. When she came out of hiding, Dita immediately missed the constant cooing of the doves, which had been part of her everyday life since she was born. This sudden silence made her feel her loneliness all the more. It was then that she really felt the loss of Pedro, Rosaura, and Roberto. She hurried up the rungs of the enormous ladder that went to the dovecote, but all she found there was the usual carpet of feathers and droppings. The wind stole through the open door and lifted some feathers that fell on a carpet of silence. Then she heard a tiny sound. A little newborn pigeon had been spared from the massacre. Tita picked it up and got ready to go back down, but first she stopped for a moment to look at the cloud of dust the soldiers' horses left in their wake. She wondered why they hadn't done anything to hurt her mother. While she was in her hiding place, she had prayed that nothing bad would happen to Mama Elena. But unconsciously, she had hoped that when she got out, she would find her mother dead. Ashamed of these thoughts, she placed the pigeon between her breasts to free her hands for the dangerous ladder and climbed down from the dovecote. From then on, her main interest lay in feeding that pathetic baby pigeon. Only then did life seem to make a little sense. It didn't compare with the satisfaction derived from nursing a human being. But in some way, it was similar. The milk in her breasts had dried up overnight from the pain of her separation from her nephew. As she looked for worms, she kept wondering who was feeding Roberto and how he was eating. Those thoughts tortured her day and night. She hadn't been able to sleep for a whole month. The only thing she accomplished during this period was to quintuple the size of her enormous bedspread. Chencha came to shake her out of her rueful thoughts. She gave her a few pushes to get her into the kitchen. She sat her down in front of the stone metate and set her to grinding the spices with the chiles. To make this process easier, it helps to add a few drops of vinegar from time to time as you're grinding. Last of all, mix the meat, finely chopped and ground, with the chiles and spices, and let the mixture rest for a while, preferably overnight. They had barely begun their grinding when Mama Elena came into the kitchen asking why the tub for her bath had not been filled. She didn't like to bathe too late or her hair wouldn't dry properly. Preparing Mama Elena's bath was quite a ceremony. The water had to be heated with lavender flowers, Mama Elena's favorite scent. Then this decoration had to be strained through a clean cloth and a few drops of aguardiente added to it. Finally, she had to carry buckets of hot water, one after another, to the dark room, a small room at one end of the house next to the kitchen. As its name indicated, this room didn't receive any light, since it had no windows. All it had was a narrow door. Inside, in the middle of the room, there was a large tub into which the water was poured. Next to it, there was a pewter pitcher for the aloe water used in washing Mama Elena's hair. Only Tita, whose mission it was to serve her until death, was allowed to be present during this ritual to see her mother naked. No one else. That's why the room had been built to prevent anyone seen in. Tita first had to wash her mother's body and then her hair, and then finally she had to go iron the clothes that Mama Elena would put on when she got out of the tub, while Mama Elena stayed in the tub relaxing and enjoying the water. At a summons from her mother, Dita helped her to dry herself and put on her warm clothes as quickly as possible so she wouldn't catch a cold. Afterward, Dita opened the door just an inch so the room would cool down a little bit and Mama Elena's body wouldn't suffer from an abrupt change of temperature. The whole while, Dita brushed her hair in that room, lit only by the weak beam of light through the crack at the door which created an eerie atmosphere as it revealed strange shapes in the rising steam. She brushed Mama Elena's hair until it was thoroughly dry, braided it, and that completed the liturgy. Tita always thanked God that her mother only bathed once a week, because otherwise her life would be a real cross to bear. In Mama Elena's opinion, both her bath and her meals were the same story. 
No matter how hard Tita tried, she always got an infinite number of things wrong. Either her blouse had a wrinkle, or there wasn't enough hot water, or her braid came out uneven. In short, it seemed Mamá Elena's genius was for finding fault. But she had never found as many faults as today. And that was because Tita really had been careless with all the fine points of the ceremony. The water was so hot that Mamá Elena burned her feet when she got in. Tita had forgotten the aloe water for her hair, burned the bottom of Mamá Elena's chemise, opened the door too far, and finally got Mamá Elena's attention the hard way and was scolded and sent from the bathroom. Tita was striding toward the kitchen, the dirty clothes under her arm, bemoaning the rebuke she'd received and her boundless failings. What grieved her the most was the extra work burning the clothes meant. It was the second time in her life that this sort of disaster had occurred. Now she had to wet the reddish stains with a solution of potassium chlorate, plain water, and soft alkaline lye, scrubbing them repeatedly until she managed to get them out, and this difficult job was added to her job of washing the black clothes her mother wore. To wash those, she had to dissolve cow bile in a small amount of boiling water, fill a soft sponge with it, and use it to dampen the clothes all over. Then she had to rinse the clothes in clear water and hang them up to dry. Tita rubbed and rubbed the clothes as many times as she had rubbed Roberto's diapers to remove the stains. What worked was to heat up a little urine, dip the stain in it for a minute, and wash it afterward in water. That is the one way to make stains fade away. But no matter how much she soaked the diaper in urine, she couldn't get rid of the horrid black color. Then she realized it wasn't Roberto's diaper she was holding, but her mother's clothes. They had been soaking in the pot where she had left them since morning, forgetting to wash them in the sink. Embarrassed, she set about correcting her error. Settled in the kitchen, Tita resolved to pay more attention to what she was doing. She had to suppress the memories that tormented her, or Mamá Elena's fury would erupt at any moment. Since she had left the sausage resting when she had gone to prepare Mamá Elena's bath, enough time had passed to go on to stuffing the casings. The casings should be pork intestines, cleaned and cured. The sausages are filled using a funnel. Tie them off tightly, four fingers apart, and poke them with a needle so that the air can escape, because air can spoil the sausage. It's very important to squeeze the sausage firmly while filling it, so you don't have to leave any spaces. Hard as Tita tried to stem the memories that assaulted her and caused her to make more mistakes, holding a large sausage in her hands, she couldn't keep from remembering the summer night when they all slept outside on the patio. During the dog days, they hung giant hammocks on the patio because of the unbearable heat. They set a large earthenware jar full of ice on a table and inside they placed a cut up watermelon in case someone was hot and got up in the middle of the night wanting to eat a slice to cool down. Mama Elena was a specialist in cutting the watermelon. Taking a sharp knife, she would drive the point in so it penetrated just to the end of the green part of the rind without touching the heart of the watermelon. She made her cuts through the rind with such mathematical precision that when she was done, she could pick up the watermelon and give it a single blow against a stone in a particular spot, and like magic, the watermelon rind would open like the petals of a flower, leaving the heart intact on the table. Unquestionably, when it came to dividing, dismantling, dismembering, Desolating, detaching, dispossessing, destroying, or dominating, Mama Elena was a pro. After she died, no one ever came close to accomplishing the same feats with the watermelon. From her hammock, Tita heard someone get up for a chunk of watermelon. This awakened in her the urge to go to the bathroom. She had been drinking beer all day long, not to cool off, but to make more milk to nurse her nephew. He was sleeping peacefully next to her sister. Getting up in the dark, she couldn't see a thing. There wasn't a glimmer of light. She was walking toward the bathroom, trying to remember where the hammocks were. She didn't want to stumble into anybody. Pedro, sitting in his hammock, 
was eating a slice of watermelon and thinking of Tita. Having her so near made him feel a tremendous excitement. He couldn't sleep, thinking of her there, a few steps from him. And from Mama Elena, too, of course. He heard the sound of footsteps in the shadows and stopped breathing for a few moments. It had to be Tita, her distinctive fragrance wafted toward him on the breeze, a mixture of jasmine and cooking odors that was hers alone. For a moment, he thought that Tita had gone up to look for him. The sound of her approaching footsteps blended with the violent beating of his heart. But no, the steps were moving away from him, to the bathroom. Pedro got up as quiet as a cat and followed her. Tita was surprised to feel someone pull her toward him and cover her mouth, but she realized who it was immediately and didn't offer any resistance as the hand first slid down her neck to her breasts and then explored her entire body. While she was receiving a kiss on the lips, Pedro took her hand in his and invited her to explore his body. Tita timidly touched the hard muscles on Pedro's arms and chest, lower down, she felt a red-hot coal that throbbed through his clothes. She removed her hand, frightened not by her discovery, but by a cry from Mama Elena. Tita, where are you? Right here, Mami. I'm going to the bathroom. Fearful that her mother would suspect something, Tita hurried back to bed where she passed a tortured night, enduring her desire to urinate along with another urge. Her sacrifice didn't do a bit of good, the following day, Mamá Elena, who for a while seemed to have changed her mind about sending Pedro and Rosada to Texas, speeded up her plans for their departure. Three days later, they had left the ranch. Those memories were banished by Mamá Elena's entry into the kitchen. Tita let the sausage she was holding fall to the floor. She suspected that her mother was able to read her thoughts. Behind Mamá Elena came Chencha, weeping unconsolably. Don't cry, child. It, it annoys me to see you cry. What has happened? Felipe has come back, and he says he's dead. Who says? Who's dead? Well, the child. What child? Tita demanded. Well, what child do you think? Well, your nephew. Whatever he ate, it didn't agree with him, and so he died. Tita felt the household crashing down around her head. The blow the sound of all the dishes breaking into a thousand pieces, she sprang to her feet. Sit down and get back to work. I don't want any tears. Poor child. I hope the good Lord has taken him in all his glory, but we can't give in to sorrow. There's work to do. First work, then do as you please, except crying. Do you hear? Tita felt a violent agitation take possession of her being. Still fingering the sausage, she calmly met her mother's gaze, and then, instead of obeying her order, she started to tear apart all the sausages she could reach, screaming wildly, Here's what I do with your orders. I'm sick of them. I'm sick of obeying you. Mama Elena went to her, picked up a wooden spoon, and smashed her across the face with it. You did it! You killed Roberto! screamed Tita beside herself, and she ran from the room, wiping the blood that dripped from her nose. She took the pigeon and a pail full of worms and climbed up to the dovecote. Mamá Elena ordered them to remove the ladder and let her stay up there overnight. Mamá Elena and Chincha finished filling the sausages in silence. Mamá Elena was always such a perfectionist and so careful to get all the air out of the sausage. No one could explain it when they discovered a week later that all the sausages in the cellar were swarming with worms. The next morning, she ordered Chencha to get Tita down from the dovecote. Mamá Elena couldn't do it because her one fear in life was heights. She couldn't bear the thought of having to climb up that ladder, twenty feet high, to get to the little door that would have to be opened in order to get in. She feigned a convenient pride, more than she actually had, and ordered someone else to bring Tita down, even though she felt a strong urge to go up there and personally drag Tita down by the hair. Chincha found Tita holding the pigeon. She didn't seem to realize it was dead. She was trying to feed it some more worms. The poor thing probably died of indigestion because Tita fed it too much. Tita looked up, her eyes vacant, and stared at Chincha as if she had never seen her before. 
Chincha came down saying Tita was acting like a crazy person and refused to leave the dovecote. Fine. If she's acting crazy, then I'm going to put her in an asylum. There's no place in this house for maniacs. And without a moment's delay, she sent Felipe for Dr. Brown to take Tita to an insane asylum. The doctor arrived, listened to Mamá Elena's version of the story, and set off up the ladder to the dovecote. He found Tita naked, her nose broken, her whole body covered with pigeon droppings. A few feathers were clinging to her skin and hair. As soon as she saw the doctor, she ran to the corner and curled up in a fetal position. No one knew how much she told Dr. Brown during the hours he spent there, but toward dark, he brought Tita down, now dressed, and she got into his carriage and drove off with him. Chincha, weeping, was running alongside the carriage as they left and barely managed to toss into Tita's shoulders the enormous bedspread she had knit during her endless nights of insomnia. It was so large and heavy, it didn't fit inside the carriage. Tita grabbed it so tightly that there was no choice but to let it drag behind the carriage like the huge train of a wedding gown that stretched for a full kilometer. Tita used any yarn she happened to have in her bedspread, no matter what the color, and it revealed a kaleidoscope combination of colors, textures, and forms that appeared and disappeared as if by magic in the gigantic cloud of dust that rose up behind it. Chapter 6. June. A Recipe for Making Matches. Preparation. The gum arabic is dissolved in enough hot water to form a paste that is not too thick. When the paste is ready, the phosphorus is added and dissolved into it, and the same is done with the potassium nitrate. Then enough minium is added to color the mixture. Tita watched in silence as Dr. Brown completed these procedures. She was sitting by the window of the doctor's little laboratory in back of the patio behind his house. The light that filtered in through the window struck her shoulders and provided a faint sensation of warmth, so slight it was almost imperceptible. A chronic chill kept her from feeling warm, in spite of being covered with her heavy woolen bedspread. One of her greatest interests was still working on the bedspread each night with yarn John had bought for her. Of the whole house, this was the place they both liked best. Tita had discovered it the week she arrived at Dr. Brown's. John, ignoring Mama Elena's order, had not put Tita in a madhouse, but had taken her to live with him. Tita would never be able to thank him enough. In a madhouse, she might have become truly insane. But here, with John's warmth toward her in word and manner, she felt better each day. Her arrival there was like a dream. Among the blurry images, she remembered the terrible pain she felt when the doctor had set her broken nose. Afterward, John's large loving hands had taken off her clothes and bathed her and carefully removed the pigeon droppings from her body, leaving her clean and sweet-smelling. Finally, he gently brushed her hair and put her in a bed with starched sheets. Those hands had rescued her from horror, and she would never forget it. Some day, when she felt like talking, she would tell John that. But now she preferred silence. There were many things she needed to work out in her mind, and she could not find the words to express the feelings seething inside her since she left the ranch. She was badly shaken. The first few days, she didn't even want to leave her room. Her food was brought to her there by Katie a seventy-year-old North American woman who, besides being in charge of the kitchen, also took care of Alex, the doctor's little boy, whose mother had died when he was born. Tita heard Alex laughing and running in the patio, but she felt no desire to meet him. Sometimes Tita didn't even taste her food, which was bland and didn't appeal to her. Instead of eating, she would stare at her hands for hours on end. She would regard them like a baby marveling that they belonged to her. She could move them however she pleased, yet she didn't know what to do with them other than knitting. She had never taken the time to stop and think about these things. At her mother's, what she had to do with her hands was strictly determined, 
No questions asked. She had to get up, get dressed, get the fire going in the stove, fix breakfast, feed the animals, wash the dishes, make the beds, fix lunch, wash the dishes, iron the clothes, fix dinner, wash the dishes, day after day, year after year. Without pausing for a moment, without wondering if this was what she wanted. Now, seeing her hands no longer at her mother's command, she didn't know what to ask them to do. She had never decided for herself before. They could do anything or become anything. They could turn into birds and fly into the air. She would like them to carry her far away as far as possible. Going to the window, facing the patio, she raised her hands to heaven. She wanted to escape from herself, didn't want to think about making a choice, didn't want to talk again. She didn't want her words to shriek her pain. She yearned with all her soul to be borne off by her hands. She stood that way for a while, looking at the deep blue of the sky around her motionless hands. Dita thought the miracle was actually occurring when she saw her fingers turning into a thin cloud rising to the sky. She prepared to ascend, drawn by a superior power, but nothing happened. Disappointed, she discovered that the smoke wasn't hers. It originated in a small room at the far end of the patio. Its chimney was emitting such a pleasant and familiar aroma that she opened the window to inhale it more deeply. Eyes closed, she saw herself beside Nacha on the kitchen floor making corn tortillas. She saw the pan where the most delicious casserole was cooking, and next to it, the beans just coming to a boil. Not even hesitating, she decided to go see who was cooking. It couldn't be Katie. The person who produced this kind of smell really knew how to cook. Never having laid eyes on her, Tita felt she knew this person, whoever she was. She strode across the patio and opened the door. There she met a pleasant woman around eighty years old. She looked a lot like Nacha. A thick braid was wound around her head, and she was wiping the sweat from her brow with her apron. Her features were plainly Indian. She was making tea in an earthenware pan. She looked up and smiled kindly, inviting Tita to sit down next to her. Tita did so. The woman immediately offered her a cup of the delicious tea. Tita sipped it slowly, drawing maximum pleasure from the aroma of the herbs, familiar and mysterious. How welcome its warmth and flavor! She stayed with the woman for a little while. The woman didn't speak either, but it wasn't necessary. From the first, they had established a communication that went far beyond words. From then on, Tita had visited her there every day. But gradually, Dr. Brown began to appear instead of the woman. The first time this happened, it had surprised her. She wasn't expecting to see him there, nor the changes he had made in the room's furnishings. Now the room contained many pieces of scientific equipment, test tubes, lamps, thermometers, and so on. The little stove no longer occupied a central place. It had been relegated to a tiny spot in the corner of the room. Moving it was not right, she felt, but since she did not want her lips to emit a single sound, she saved that opinion for later as well as her questions about the whereabouts and identity of the woman. Besides, she had to admit that she also enjoyed John's company a good deal. There was just one difference. He did speak to her as he worked, but instead of cooking, he was testing theories scientifically. He had inherited his fondness for experimentation from his grandmother, a Kikapu Indian who John's grandfather had captured and brought back to live with him far from her tribe. Despite this and the fact that he married her, she was never accepted as his legal wife by the grandfather's proud, intensely Yankee family. So John's grandfather had built this room for her at the back of the house, where she could spend most of the day doing what interested her most, studying the curative properties of plants. The room also served as her refuge from the family's attacks. One of the first was to give her the nickname the Kikapu, 
instead of calling her by her real name, thinking that this would really upset her. For the Browns, the word Kikapu summoned up everything that was most disagreeable in the world. But this was not at all the case with morning light. To her, it meant just the opposite and was an enormous source of pride. That is but one small example of the huge difference in ideas and opinions that existed between the representatives of these two very different cultures, a gulf that made it impossible for the Browns to feel any desire to learn about the customs and traditions of morning light. Years passed before they began to discover a bit of the culture of the Kikapu, when John's great-grandfather, Peter, was very sick with a lung disease. His face was constantly purple from his fits of coughing. He wasn't getting enough air. His wife, Mary, knew something about medicine, since her father was a doctor. She knew that in cases like this, the body of the sick person is producing too many red blood cells, so it is advisable to perform a bleeding to counter this imbalance and prevent the success of blood cells from causing an infarction or thrombosis, either of which can sometimes cause the death of the patient. So John's great-grandmother, Mary, started preparing some leeches for bleeding her husband. As she worked, she felt quite proud of herself for being up to date with the best scientific knowledge, which allowed her to protect her family's health using an appropriate modern method, not like the Kikapu and her herbs. The leeches are placed inside a glass containing a half a finger of water and left there for an hour. The part of the body to which they will be applied is washed with lukewarm sugar water. Meanwhile, the leeches are placed in a clean handkerchief, which is folded over them. Then they are turned out onto the part of the body where they are to be attached, held down firmly with the handkerchief, and pressed into the skin so they don't pierce some other spot. To continue the bloodletting after the leeches have been removed, it helps to rub the skin with warm water. To control the bleeding and close the wounds, cover them with cloth or poplar bark and then apply a poultice of breadcrumbs and milk, which is removed when the wounds have formed scabs. Mary followed all of this to the letter, but when she pulled the leeches from Peter's arm, he started to lose blood and the hemorrhage couldn't be stopped. When the Kikapu heard the desperate screams coming from the house, she ran to see what was happening. As soon as she went to the sick man and placed one of her hands on his wounds, the bleeding stopped. His family was absolutely astounded. Then she asked if they would please leave her alone with the sick man. After what they had just seen, no one dared say no. She spent the entire afternoon at her father-in-law's bedside, singing strange melodies and applying curing herbs wreathed in the smoke of the copal and incense she burned. It was well into the night before the bedroom door opened and she came out, a cloud of incense surrounding her. Behind her appeared Peter, completely restored. After that, the Kikapu was their family doctor. Within the North American community, she was widely accepted as a miracle healer. John's grandfather wanted to build a much larger room for her to carry on her investigations, but she didn't want one. In the whole house, she couldn't have a better place than her little laboratory. In her laboratory, John had passed most of his childhood and adolescence. He stopped visiting it when he entered the university because the modern medical theories he was learning there were in strong opposition to his grandmother's theories, to everything he had learned from her. As medical research progressed, John remembered his grandmother's teachings and the initiation she had given him in medicine. Now, after years of work and study, he had returned to her laboratory. He was convinced that only there would he find the most advanced medicine. If he could scientifically prove all the miracle cures morning light had accomplished. Dita loved to watch him work. With him, there were always things to learn and discover, like now, when he was making matches and conducting class on phosphorus and its properties at the same time. 
Phosphorus was discovered in 1669 by Brandt, a Hamburg chemist, who was looking for the philosopher's stone. He believed that metal could be transmuted into gold by mixing it with extract of urine. Using this method, he obtained a luminous substance that burned with an intensity such as had never been seen before. For a long time, phosphorus was obtained by vigorously heating the residue from evaporating urine in an earth retort, the neck of which was submerged in water. Today, it is extracted from the bones of animals, which contained phosphoric acid and lime. Talking didn't make the doctor careless in his preparation of the matches. He had no trouble separating mental and physical activities. He could philosophize about even the most profound aspects of life without his hands pausing or making a mistake. While he was talking to Tita, he kept on making matches. Now that we have the phosphorus mixture, the next step is to prepare the cardboard for the matches. Dissolve a pound of potassium nitrate in a pound of water, stir in a little saffron to add color, and dip the cardboard in the solution. When it dries, cut the cardboard into narrow strips and place a little of the phosphorus mixture on the end of each strip. Allow the matches to dry, buried in sand. While the strips were drying, the doctor showed Tita an experiment. While phosphorus doesn't combine with oxygen to burn at ordinary temperatures, it does burst into flame very rapidly at an elevated temperature. Watch. The doctor placed a small amount of phosphorus in a tube that was closed at one end and full of mercury. He melted the phosphorus by holding the tube over the flame of the candle. Then, using a small bell jar containing oxygen, he transferred the gas to the jar very, very slowly. When the oxygen reached the top of the jar, where it encountered the melted phosphorus, an explosion occurred, brilliant, instantaneous, like a flash of lightning. As you see, within our bodies, each one of us has the elements needed to produce phosphorus. And let me tell you something I've never told a soul. My grandmother has a very interesting theory. She said that each of us is born with a box of matches inside us, but we can't strike them all by ourselves. Just as in the experiment, we need oxygen and a candle to help. In this case, the oxygen, for example, would come from the breath of the person you love. The candle could be any kind of food, music, caress, word, or sound that engenders the explosion that lights one of the matches. For a moment, we are dazzled by an intense emotion. A pleasant warmth grows within us, fading slowly as time goes by, until a new explosion comes along to revive it. Each person has to discover what will set off those explosions in order to live, since the combustion that occurs when one of them is ignited is what nourishes a soul. That fire, in short, is its food. If one doesn't find out in time what will set off those explosions, the box of matches dampens, and not a single match will ever be lighted. If that happens, the soul flees from the body and goes to wander among the deepest shades, trying in vain to find food to nourish itself, unaware that only the body it left behind, cold and defenseless, is capable of providing that food. How true these words were! Nobody knew it better than she. Unfortunately, she had to admit that her own matches were damp and moldy. No one would ever be able to light another one again. And the saddest thing was that she knew what set off her explosions, but each time she managed to light a match, it had persistently been blown out. As if reading her thoughts, John went on. That's why it's important to keep your distance from people who have frigid breath. Just their presence can put out the most intense fire, with results we're familiar with. If we stay a good distance away from those people, it's easier to protect ourselves from being extinguished. Taking one of Tita's hands in his, he added simply, 
There are many ways to dry out a box of damp matches, but you can be sure there is a cure. Dita felt tears run down her face. Gently, John dried them with his handkerchief. You must, of course, take care to light the matches one at a time. If a powerful emotion should ignite them all at once, they would produce a splendor so dazzling that it would illuminate far beyond what we could normally see, and then a brilliant tunnel would appear before our eyes, revealing the path we forgot the moment we were born, and summoning us to regain the divine origin we had lost. The soul ever longs to return to the place from which it came, leaving the body lifeless. Ever since my grandmother died, I have been trying to demonstrate this theory scientifically. Perhaps some day I will succeed. What do you think? Dr. Brown remained silent to give Tita time to say something if she wished, but she was as silent as stone. Well, I, I mustn't bore you with my talk. Let's take a break, but before we go, I'd like to show you a game my grandmother and I used to play. We spent most of the day here, and she taught me her secrets through games. She was a quiet woman, like you, sitting in front of her stove, her heavy braid wrapped around her head. She was always able to read my thoughts. I wanted to learn how to do it, so after much begging, she gave me my first lesson. She would write a sentence on the wall, using some invisible substance, without my seeing. When I looked at the wall at night, I would find out what she had written. Do you want to try it? From what he'd said, Dita realized that the woman she'd sat with so often was John's dead grandmother. Now she didn't need to ask him. The doctor took a piece of phosphorus in a rag and gave it to Tita. I don't want to break the rule of silence you have imposed, so as a secret between us, I'm going to ask you to write the reason you won't talk on that wall over there as soon as I leave, all right? Tomorrow I will divine the words before your eyes. What the doctor neglected to tell Tita, of course, was that one of the properties of phosphorus was that it would glow in the dark, revealing what she had written on the wall. He had no real need of this subterfuge to know what she was thinking, but he thought it would be a good way for Tita to start communicating with the world again, if only in writing. John could see she was ready. When the doctor left, Tita took the phosphorus and went up to the wall. That night, when John Brown entered the laboratory, he was pleased to see the writing on the wall, in firm, phosphorescent letters. Because I don't want to. With those words, Dita had taken her first step toward freedom. Meanwhile, she was staring up at the ceiling, unable to stop thinking of John's words. Was it possible for her soul to stir again? With her whole being, she wanted to believe that it was. She had to find someone who could kindle her desire. Could that someone be John? She was remembering the pleasant sensation that ran through her body when he took her hand in the laboratory. No, she wasn't sure. The only thing she was absolutely sure about was that she did not want to return to the ranch. She never wanted to live near Mama Elena again.